So first, I would like to ask uh, the speakers if they have any questions for each other. Um, I, ha I have one uh, question, uh, Kevin, about um, whether uh, Torrance read Wittgenstein. Oh. Did, um, I, I was just put in mind of the dawning of an aspect, and, and it seems to me that would be uh, such a powerful uh, evocation of, of both of intuitionism mm. and rule following, and I, uh, I wonder uh, if that's within his worldview. I'm not an expert on Torrance, but I never came across the name. Uh, of Wittgenstein or huh. many other analytic philosophers either. We were thinking along the same lines because I was thinking of Jaspro's duck rabbit. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's in, in, in terms of Wittgenstein and with the objectivism, I mean, here you have an object, right? I mean, but you have to see it under an aspect. The object can't just give itself to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, but you have to be, is that, is, are, are you But that's not, not like a stereogram. That? A stereogram works differently and Polanyi, is Torrance's go-to person yeah. here as far yeah. as explaining the, um, you know, what actually happens in a disclosure situation. Maybe it has, to, maybe it only works, that is the stereogram when there's a certain degree of complexity. The duck rabbit yeah. figure is, is simple. Yeah. And there aren't enough clues, but there are many such clues in these complicated uh, magic eye pictures. <laughs> But if I put a duck rabbit in a stereogram. <laughs> <laughs> there, okay. You know, like half, half the people would say, you know, we'd be killing each other, like, right? By, by the end of the day, like, no, it's a duck, no, it's a rabbit, no, it's a duck, no. And we, but how would we resolve it? Well, I would Just say, I see a duck rabbit. <laughs> see a duck <laughs> But I, I take your point. I take no, your I point. Yeah, I mean, I like the idea. I mean, it's, it's a very Bardian idea. You, uh, uh, theology works from its object. The thing but, is, is uh, it is a conversation stopper, though. Yeah. Um, that, that's what troubles me a little bit, is that if I don't see it, there's not a lot more that can be said in the discussion, mm -hmm. except go right. back and look again. Mm -hmm. And there may be a time where that is the right thing to say, if I haven't paid attention sufficiently. But it, it, it would, it, in the wrong hands, mm -hmm. it could be a cop-out. But do we disagree? Um, um, I'm not sure, because I never want to disagree with you. But with, like, with the agent intellect, don't we also, as subjects, make a contribution to the object? Mm -hmm. uh, Torrance is open to the, so yes, it's not that you simply, sorry, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not something that you relax. You're actively paying attention, but um, you, know, you aren't constructing the reality to which you are attending. But you're involved, yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we are disagreeing on that point. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. I was struck by commonalities. So we didn't, I didn't see your papers ahead of time, but Bart's concern for the middle distance, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and then uh, Balthazar's concern for philosophy to play a role. Mm -hmm. uh, that, was, uh, that was my question to Torrance. Is there a place for metaphysics in your scheme? Mm -hmm. So this is a question uh, for, primarily for Steve, but Kate and Kevin weigh in as well. Um, you talked about Balthazar, uh, how he, he identified these two temptations, the Dionysian and the Promethean. Mm. Um, do you think that it would be safe to say that for Christians working in the scientists today, the Promethean is the more pressing? Um, so, uh, for example, um, my sister's a graduate student in immunology, mm -hmm. and she uh, gave me a call uh, a couple months back uh, and said, hey, Joel, um, I need you to help me think theologically about working on humanized mice. Mm -hmm. And I said, <laughs> I'll get back to you. <laughs> um, because I didn't have the categories. Um, so with technologies like CRISPR-Cas9, gene, gene editing, uh, and these sorts of things, um, are scientists working in uh, are Christians working in the sciences today, are they facing that Promethean temptation in a new and more pressing way? And if so, how can our churches help them to identify it and resist it? Yes, to the first, I do think the Promethean temptation would be the temptation 
and uh, Dr. Sonderager's paper yesterday about post-human evolution, and once you begin to, to examine post-human evolution, my friend Brent Waters down the road is doing a lot of work with post-human evolution, and he always says, you know, you can't look into the abyss too long before it just stares back at you and you're sort of horrified. Um, I don't know, perhaps the question is, should there be forbidden knowledge? Should there be certain things that you say, you know, and, and I, I, I take it at some level, we would have to say yes to this. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. something like torturing someone to find out how they respond in a biology class. I take it that's not done here. I mean, and it would be bad form to do it. So, I mean, so obviously there's some, there's some idea that there's forbidden knowledge. But to just to press this idea beginning in the church. There are some forms of knowledge you simply should not pursue because they can't be ordered to God, because they will make you less than human. Um, the, the, I guess the really frightening prospect is uh, what if these things work? Mm -hmm. You know, what if they really work? Like, what if you really can download consciousness into a supercomputer and uh, uh, would we all be tempted to do it, you know, to the really to the people we love, um, you know, like, like certain s sort of, sorts of stem cell uh, re reparative therapies, you know, when you're when you're losing a child, when you're faced with all kinds of really difficult circumstances, you seem to get. To, I don't know. That doesn't answer your question very well, but um, maybe you would. But your paper yesterday dealt with that a bit. Mm. I, d I do think these are the. Uh, deep questions that um, Kevin helped us um, look at by raising the question about talking about not the idea of science, but uh, people who are scientists working in the fields. And they are doing things, particularly in medicine, that are at the absolute border of what we think of as the natural and the human. Um, and I, I think as, as Christians, we miss a chance to both uh, witness to the gospel and to um, protect and defend the good creatures of God by not looking at what it is that is being proposed, um, what is being suggested, mm -hmm. um, what... Uh, what is the um, quiet impulse at, um, at some of these meeting points between medicine and physics and uh, genetic biology? Uh, and I, th I do think there are uh, clear cases in human medicine as there are in weapon design uh, that should mm -hmm. be off limits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that we should do it on the basis of doctrinal and moral teaching. May I put a plug in for a classic book by Oliver O'Donovan, Begotten mm -hmm. or Made? Yeah. Yeah. It has to do with the idea of what a person <laughs> is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He takes his cue from Nicaea. Persons are begotten. They're like us. Mm -hmm. But what we make is unlike us and we feel we can manipulate what we make, mm -hmm. and yet we can't respect what we make as persons that are not like us. And he has some wonderful reflections on the implications of this. He thinks we're in, a middle, uh, in the middle of a revolution, yeah. where revolution means taking responsibility for your own future. Mm -hmm. And he mm -hmm. wonders whether science is in a position to take responsibility for our future, if it loses this all-important distinction between begetting mm -hmm. and making. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that the very concept of nature in um, one sense, that is being notum, being born, yes. is lost. Lost, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So do we have questions from the audience for the panel? Can you just say the title of Oliver and Adam's book? Begotten or Made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was influenced by Ramsey's Fabricated Man, one of the early books on bioethics. You know, Donovan, that's another one that's very, okay. it might be more pressing today than it was when he wrote it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Murray. 
Thank you. I wonder if we could just rehabilitate the notion uh, T.F. Torrance developed in retort of to John Hick, that is, you need to repent. Because there is something important we all need to recover in this context of this debate there, isn't there? After all, the call to repent is a biblical call. Um, and we all stand in need of that metanoia, not to Torrance's theology, I don't think he would say, but rather to the mind of Christ. And that um, bears upon the kind of ethical considerations that Kate has just mentioned, for instance, uh, the kind of knowledge that's off limits and so on. It is true that we all see through a, dark, a glass darkly, and we will not see it clearly until our minds are conformed to Christ. So that aspect that I think that Torrance is putting his finger on is a very important one for us. Mm -hmm. well, I certainly agree that we need to repent whenever we've transgressed or forgotten the creature-creator distinction. So then we're on the brink of committing idolatry. So we always have to repent of that temptation to elevate ourselves up to the... So I do, I, of course, repentance is, is vital. It's just in this particular situation of Christian theologians looking at scripture or trying to think about doctrine, when there's a disagreement, um, it's, it's a little frustrating if I can't see what I'm supposed to see. And, I, and I'm wondering, is it my fault simply? Do I really need to repent again? Or has perhaps a, a move been made that was premature, as uh, Professor Schwebel was hinting? So I... I I'm open to what you think about that, uh, even now. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that as theologians, we're all in the same position, actually, of needing to repent together mm -hmm. so that we will see more clearly together. So it's not one stands over another calling them to repent so that you'll see things my way. It's a, it's a call for all of us, I think, to work together towards that metanoia, which uh, Scripture calls us to. Okay. I can live with that. Steve Williams. Uh, can I come in on this discussion? Because <clears throat> let me say it from the standpoint of a layperson. Um, layperson might say that it's impossible to adjudicate this question of eschatological knowledge versus present knowledge without giving examples because there are certain things we ought to know now and ought to see now, and certain other things which we can say, no, we can't know them now. So is it possible abstractly to discuss this question? I ask myself, and on behalf of lay people. The, the question of forbidden knowledge? Yes, the question raised initially by Christoph Schobel about whether Torrance was too premature. Well. We'd have to have examples. Maybe in one respect he was, maybe in another not. I just don't see how it can easily be right. discussed right. without examples. Mm -hmm. And that would be the ordinary person, the pew's uh, perception. I think, yes, certain things we should know. I mean, not just any person, the pew. You know what I mean? There's certain things we should know now, and you should see them. Mm -hmm. But other things, no, those things can be left. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christoph Schubel? Uh, Christoph? If I may just offer um, a, a famous example, um, the th uh, doctrine of the three lights, for example, is at the end, you would expect me to say that as a Lutheran, of Luther's On the Bondage of the Will, where he says there are some questions which we cannot decide here, although the light of grace already shines on us. We see much clearer what is the purpose of creation, because we have experienced through grace that it is there to demonstrate the love of God to us and to draw us into communion with God. But we have experienced that in our own lives. But we have no judgment about what happens to other people. We're very concerned whether they will also be saved in a similar way. But there is this kind of epistemic modesty that we have to adhere to as long as God has not, um, so to say, let his light of glory shine upon us. That would be a very concrete example. Um, and I think a, a good one, because that pro um, helps to um, prevent any kind of general theories about uh, election and reprobation, but says, well, look here, that precisely is the point where you can make stand, uh, statements about that. There is something which is very similar to Murray's point. Um, 
repent is always the question of my position vis-a-vis -vis the object that um, discloses itself, himself, herself, Godself, um, in this situation. Um, may I ask one, one question of you um, in connection with all three, Bart von Balthasar and Torrance? Is it not the case that um, a doctrine of revelation only makes sense if it's a general doctrine of revelation? I don't mean um, a doctrine of general revelation. I mean um, saying that revelation, disclosure, is the basic form of all knowledge, that knowledge which is constituted for us by discovery, disclosure, and so on. And so that the agent intellect is always dependent on the knowledge that's constituted for us, which is not knowledge that's constituted by us, that would be Kant. And, but it gets working on that which is constituted for us, and then gets into discussions about the disagreements that may, might come from that. And the only way in which we can handle these would be um, communication, would be discussion, would be dialogue, which would be one of the situations where further disclosures could appear. So that would be one of the strategies of, of handling uh, Kevin's problem. How do we deal with that in a pluralistic situation? Once this is a dialogical pluralism, we can help not that we convince one another, but that together the object, so to say, to talk Torrance's language, shows itself. If, I think the only possibility in which one can make that into a valid epistemological theory, one would have to say, that is valid across the board. That's for science as well as philosophy, as well as theology. They all work like that. They have differences within the kind of disclosure that's there. But for realism, we have to suppose that it's always reality that constitutes our knowledge of reality. Uh, would that not be something that the, all three of the persons we discussed share? in a very important way, and there are just variations on this common theme among, uh, among them. Would you see that like that? Mm -hmm. I certainly think that is important to Bart. I, th I think his um, conviction and general instinct was to claim that whatever it is that we Christians say about uh, scripture about language, uh, about um, the significance of uh, preaching is predicated on something that is universally the case, uh, true of all language, true of all uh, a disclosure through revelation, uh, a, a, a general understanding of history and of time. I, I wonder whether there isn't some tension, at least, um, if not incoherence, between that claim, which I take to be very strong in Bard, and this other theme that Torrance uh, latches onto in a programmatic way, that the object dictates the method. I, th I think if you held to that in a strong and programmatic way, I think you'd have to have pluralism in your epistemology. I, th I think that follows. And, and um, uh, e either that or you'd have to have a monism in your doctrine of creation. And, uh, and I think um, it, in fact, uh, I hear Torrance also holding to this uh, general principle of manifestation and uh, self-disclosure as the ground of revelation and of truth, of realism. Uh, and yet he holds to this catafusic uh, account of the object and the method. Does that um, seem plausible to you, Kevin? You know Torrance so much better than I do. No, I don't. Um, <laughs> Torrance always liked to wrap himself in the mantle of Bart. He mm. always would say that, you know, right. he had talked with Bart about this or <laughs> yeah, that with regard right. to science. And, and I, yeah. I'd, I'd that's love all to they know. ever did, apparently. What I'd love to know, Bart is maybe you know what Bart <laughs> actually thought about what he was doing. Uh, did he give his blessing or imprimatur to? the way towards you, because he does appeal to Bart for that principle. I, yeah, that's right. And I, you know, I don't hear it as a principle in okay. Bart, but I take it 
um, that what was uh, an instinct in BART becomes a principle in Torrance. And that's uh, one of the things that interests me in that uh, transition from BART to Torrance. Didn't BART deal with this to some extent that his correspondence or exchange with Heinrich Schultz about the mm -hmm. nature of mm -hmm. science? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. is, did he not declare himself as to what a scientific approach would be in general? Because even with yeah. hermeneutics, right. you know, he, he, BART's fairly clear that um, you know, uh, he he has general principles. It's basically follow the follow the words. It's mm -hmm. it's not impose a meaning and so on. He's a kind of realist there too. Yes, yes, and I think um, I, you know Bart's uh, realism. I think is of um, I think a fairly straightforward kind. But I I take him not to take the second step to move from these fundamental convictions about realism and theology to a programmatic okay. and principled realism. That would be a difference, realism. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it seems that perhaps you wouldn't disagree with this. I don't know if, if Bart or Torrance would. I don't think they would. The problem, part of the difficulty with any method is that we're looking for a method that you can use in any circumstance, and there simply is no such thing. Um, I mean, if it's met hodas, you know, along the way, it's mm -hmm. one thing, but the, the mm -hmm. emphasis on method in the modern era just seems to me to, it's, it's looking for something, it's looking for a kind of algorithm, you know, if we could just get the right method. So in some, in some circumstances, like in speculative um, um, thought, I think allowing the object, you know, to disclose itself makes, makes sense, you know, I mean, in, in mathematics it makes, it would make sense. Um, but in, but, in, but in ethics, where it's, it's got to be practical rationality, because you know, ethics can be other. You just can't, you know, we're never mm. going to have a method, mm. Uh, mm. we're never going to have an app for ethics, I hope, where you, know, you just put in, here's my conundrum, and here's how it comes out. <laughs> so, I mean, so part of this has to do with speculative, and I, I think we have to re recover the importance of speculative thought, uh, in, in the sense that the, the speculative, in, in the middle, at least for Aquinas, was knowledge that can't be other. Um, because you know, you, you know what the thing is, but not everything is a thing to be known. And you know, how you navigate a lot of ethical questions has to do with this practical rationale, which makes it so difficult. Kevin's work here, um, uh, Hector's work on, um, I, I don't know if you've read Zagzebski, but I would think that your work would fit well with exemplarism, the idea that we have these patterns of persons, and, what, and this is why I like virtue ethics, People say virtue ethics doesn't have any application. Like that utilitarianism, you could create an algorithm of utilitarianism, it's so simple. You know, it's like, uh, even though you don't know what utility is, but we won't force you, whatever you think it is, uh, it's, it's fine. But virtue ethics does have an application, and I think it's similar to exemplarism, and what, you, what you've done is, and it says that, well, here's what we should do. We should do what the virtuous do. Now that just, okay, so then the next question, well, who are the virtuous? But that would be an interesting conversation. Well, I think the virtuous are Dorothy Day and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and my grandmother. You know, and uh, here's what she would do in this situation. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't know. That doesn't, but that does not give you uh, knowledge that can't be other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And disclosure. Yeah. And we have time for one more question. <coughs> I'm going to attempt a synthesis here and then ask a question. Um, so we have the principle that, that Torrance and the others have, have articulated that the, you know, what we know is determined by the object of knowledge. And, and we've also seen that it's equally important that what we know is determined by the object of knowledge plus the state of the knower, right? So there's this irreducible personalism which von Balthasar and, and which Bart have articulated mm -hmm. that um, knowledge exists not as a tertium quid, but as, as a, a network of relations between persons, um, which are not um, equivalent to propositions uh, or to facts, right? So uh, I wonder if the question of interpretive disagreement, um, which, which we're all coming back to, um, might not be answered the way Oliver O'Donovan does it, and, and in much the way Dr. Long has just presented, which is to say that 
the solution is not a method. It's not ready to hand, right? And, and, to, and to seek for a method in answering this sort of a question is actually a denial of agency and a denial of our call to be human agents and actors in the moment, right? Because if we were to universalize, how do we know what the correct answer is? We, we would be in some way sidestepping the issue of the irreducibility of personhood. Does that make any sense? Does that seem to be a synthesis of, of the things that, that have been discussed here? Would that be an accurate read? I, th I think in, in Bart's case, the, the personalism that seemed to me central in his doctrine of creation was the the way in which we should understand creation as history, that it's this uh, personal encounter between a holy God who is creator and creatures who are also sinners. Uh, I, I think that Barb might be reluctant to agree that there is something about the character of the knower, that, that Thomistic principle that the thing is, is known according to the uh, character of the knower. I think this runs counter to his conviction that knowledge is a subdivision of the justification doctrine. I, I think uh, he's, I think Bard is radical on this point and that it's really only uh, God uh, giving us what we actually have no capacity and character and uh, constraint for uh, that allow us to know the reality of God and the presence of Christ in any way. Uh, so that might be uh, a yes, but uh, some hesitation too. And I, I think the importance of language uh, is, is essential here, so that we can have the object disclose itself to us. But what we do is we, you know, we we have to try to communicate. And the whole idea that is, as uh, uh, as people created in the image of God, part of what that means it means many things. But part of what it means is that we have to communicate with each other in all the ways that uh, that important word um, suggests in an in an encounter with the other. So. I think I heard you describing something along the lines of how Gadamer might describe conversation about a text where there is a conflict of interpretations, and yet the understanding grows as the conversation continues. There's a deeper insight into the subject matter. And it isn't a method, right? He's written truth or method, so he's not proposing a method, but there is something to do for persons to do together. Will you join me in thanking our panel? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.